Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today on Insight New Mexico in the Mercury Library with Ona Porter, who is the president and CEO of something called Prosperity Works, a nonprofit that helps limited income families acquire financial education and asset planning that can eventually lead to the development of accounts and, and, and other financial instruments that help them uh, progress out of poverty if, if such a thing is possible these days. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about payday loan sharking uh, and about how they're faring in the legislature who funds uh, the lobbying efforts. Uh, we're also going to talk about this strange and awful reality in the world where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So it's wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, I look really forward to a good conversation today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Before we get into what I like to think of as thug lending, uh, could we talk a little bit about uh, Prosperity Works and what it does and how it started and its mission and how long it's been operating and what its successes have been so far. So Prosperity Works um, is a statewide organization that is focused on building assets among uh, limited income populations. And uh, we focus on building assets because we believe that income gets you by, but assets get you ahead. And so as a Ooh. consequence, this is um, uh, a focus that really uh, frees people from poverty in 18 months with the various products that we offer. Well, that's incredible. All my years as a starving journalist, I would have loved to have had something for 18 months and I could get myself out of the, out of the hole. Could you ramify on that a little bit more? Certainly. So one of the products is called individual development accounts, and those are matched savings accounts. And... Mm -hmm. um, and they are, uh, people are eligible to save after they've completed 10 weeks of financial capability training. And in that financial capability training, we really understand and are launching what we call the three-legged stool of asset development. And that is uh, personal assets, social assets, and financial assets. We believe it's those three that allow people to control their lives. So people save, and when they reach their goal, we match them four to one for the purchase of a first home to capitalize a small business or for post-secondary education. And 90% of the people who work with us are successful in doing that. So what kind of, what kind of training do you, uh, uh, do you give people who are not used to saving? Uh, is there a system or, or a process that you, uh, that you lead them into to help them? Our financial capability um, approach is one that is comprehensive. We uh, think that what low-income people need to know is not any different than you and I need to know. And as a consequence, um, it is something of uh, a process of self-discovery that is facilitated uh, sometimes by a certified financial planner, uh, but others are trained uh, financial capability um, uh, teachers. And in this process of, of discovery, for instance, we have um, activities that are, um, for instance, leaking. And so a leaking activity is one where we ask you to write down everything you spent in the last week. And next week you come and tell us. But the thing that you really tell us is, if I didn't drink that Gatorade once a day, seven days a week, I could save $9 a week, huh. right? Huh. So um, it really is uh, helping people look at themselves, their goals, um, their realities and figure it out. Really, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. <laughs> God. What, so, so can I ask you where uh, uh, who your principal funders are? The funders for um, the individual development contract uh, uh, project are many. The primary one has been the federal government. We have had four million dollar uh, federal grants in the last ten years, and but every one of those grants has to be matched locally dollar for dollar. Okay. So we have to have a local dollar to draw down a federal dollar. But um, in addition to that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we have outcomes that are 90%. 90% of the people who enter this are successful. Across the nation, that's closer to 35, 37%. But here, it's but here it is uh, 90%. And um, and I need two dollars for every federal dollar to get to get those outcomes. But I think that none, nothing less than that, um, is what we need to be doing. 
the people that we serve have run into a dead end alley going 100 miles an hour most of their lives. And uh, with our comprehensive approach, with our coaching approach, which really says these are whole and complete people who've lacked opportunity, um, we have tremendous success. So where did the, the match money come locally? Well, we early were successful in having um, a considerable amount of state money to match. Um, you know, 2008, everything went south, and we don't have that anymore. Uh, but last year, we were at least able to get our toe in the water again with $100,000 from the state, and we're hoping to get that much this year. But other money comes from individuals and from foundations. Uh, we have a few banking partners. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I feel like every day I need to get down on Central in a monkey suit and <laughs> raise the money. <laughs> so if, um, if I was where I was, say, uh, maybe 50 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and I had a choice to go uh, to get a loan from, from someone who's going to charge me 2,500% or the prosperity works was in existence, mm -hmm. uh, I would probably choose to go to, uh, to prosperity works. What, what would I have to have saved up in order to get a four, uh, a four time match? So most of the people that uh, we work with come to us with no savings. No savings. And, um, and these are not loans. These are grants that match their savings. So after they complete their financial capability training, uh, they also make a savings plan. And in addition to that, they make an asset plan. And they begin to work toward their asset goal, which can be post-secondary education, uh, a home, or to start or expand a small business. So they actually save during that a period of time, and the average amount of time it takes people to save to reach their goal, which can be as much as $1,000, is about 18 months. What a contrast. The bedlam of walking into a loan shark office mm -hmm. and handing somebody the title to your car or your house or your life or your child or whatever mm -hmm. it might be and uh, coming to Prosperity Works. How do people know about you uh, and, and how do they get in? We work through community-based partners across the state to deliver our products and services. And it's part of our philosophy. Um, use trusted entities, um, and then you don't have to sell this product, this idea. And the truth is, lots of people think, oh, you know, there's something going on here that isn't the real deal, right? You're really going to match my money four to one? Um, and, and so those trusted partners, the largest one is uh, uh, Central New Mexico Community College, CNM. And uh, the smallest one is actually an indigenous farmers organization called Cuatro Puertas. But we work through, um, uh, you know, Working Classroom is a partner. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a partner. HomeWise is a partner. Mm. So they're partners all over the state. That, and, uh, and we essentially uh, are the rainmakers on this. Uh, we have designed, uh, are, are constantly doing research on the, the product uh, to see how it's doing, but we also fund it pretty much entirely statewide. We also train our, uh, the coaches in our partner organizations and, um, and supervise them and provide technical to assist assistance to them every day of the week. So here we have what you all are doing, and here we over here, we have one in my mind is the is, is the dark the Darth Vader of the lending industry mm -hmm. uh, crushing people squeezing them doing the worst possible things what's happening up there with with the with the efforts to control loan sharking in New Mexico uh, what do you think the prospects are this year and what about next year so as we think about uh, what we have been moving through the legislature, and that was the idea of a 36% rate cap on all storefront lending, all kinds of products. First of all, we chose that number because the Department of Defense uh, implemented that rule for all active military personnel uh, some years ago, and they did it because uh, military readiness was being compromised by these loans. Sure. And... And so uh, they passed that, and we've got you know several years of uh, good data that says the sky is not going to fall when we close uh, this huge industry that is is preying on the the poorest of our citizens. 
And, um, you know, people may not know that there are more of these storefront lenders in New Mexico than there are all the fast food restaurants of all varieties in our state. God, that's un- unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So, you mentioned earlier uh, that they have this enormous lobbying force behind them. Mm-hmm. Could you describe a little bit about that in, in terms of its size? And who supports these guys? Who? Well, it's really... Uh, they uh, these loan storefronts appear to be local people doing local business. In fact, eighty percent of them are from out of state. <laughs> and you may have heard uh, the very slick guy who represents the industry is is really kind of the face of the industry. He's actually based in Atlanta, <laughs> and um, and so eighty percent of the hundred and ten million dollars that people are saying are paying in fees and interest each year in New Mexico is leaving our state, 80% of it. And, you know, we've had huge success in terms of municipalities and counties passing resolutions, sending them to um, to our legislature, saying we support the 36% cap, as well as over 260 faith leaders, um, as well as, uh, you know, we've had endorsements from the largest newspapers in our state, and, um, and people everywhere want this done. But the lobby is enormous. We, uh, I haven't counted exactly this year, but last year there were 24 lobbyists. And they are the highest paid, most powerful lobbyists in our state that are being paid to maintain this industry. Who's making all this money? Well, the people who are making it are not New Mexicans. And we believe that the reason that the municipalities and um, and commi- uh, county commissions have passed this resolution is they understand that this impact is not just an impact on households, and they are very low-income households, uh, but also on uh, community economic growth, that this is a major drain on, um, on what might be the dollars turning over in their communities. So we've heard that um, that there have been moves in the legislature to uh, to uh, disempower uh, municipalities and counties uh, operating in this way to uh, uh, to try and stop this kind of loan sharking going on. Mm-hmm. Is that a trend that's going to be successful for these guys, or or is it uh, losing steam? It's, it's difficult to say at this point what the final outcome is going to be. Um, last night, uh, there was a, re- um, a bill passed that has to do specifically with refund anticipation loans. Those are loans that are made anticipating federal and state tax returns, right? right? And um, and it there was a huge floor fight about this, and uh, and yet it did pass. So it will, uh, you know, move on to the Senate. And there's a bill, uh, a companion bill in the Senate that will probably be heard in judiciary tomorrow. So it's really, we're really playing defense now. And, um, and, you know, it's, it's accountability time, really. Money in politics is huge. We know that. And, um, and these guys have all the money in the world. And the idea that these legislators are, um, are really voting for this industry to license these sharks as opposed to care for the people of New Mexico who are least able to care for themselves is just obscene. So I'm still really interested in who actually is making this money. If 80% of this money is leaving the state, uh, 80% of, uh, 100% of which we need, uh, who is getting this dough? Well, they really are big companies from outside of our state. And you probably have seen the emergence recently of things like uh, Tio Rico. Yes. Uh huh. And um, and these are the storefronts. And and many times there is one large out of state uh, corporation that owns many different licenses in our state and appear under many different names. But the other thing you will see also is a real concentration of these. So you can stand on uh, the corner. I think it is. Second and Candelaria, maybe, mm-hmm. and um, and toss you know uh, a baseball in any direction and hit one of these, right? And it's because of the the business model that they have, which is um, a model that depends upon uh, these uh, these loans being renewed over and over again. 
Um, in fact, we know that on average, they are turned over six times. And it is with that that people dig themselves into a hole that they just can't get out of. But if you really want to know about the details of all the players who are involved in this, um, you can look on our website that we've put up specifically for this purpose, which is called lo LoanSharkAttack.com. I'm wondering, are big banks uh, uh, behind these companies? And, and because this practice is still legal in New Mexico, they have the opportunity to lend money to lenders without any any legal problem. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's not a moral problem for them. So you're right, you know, and it's interesting to be in the legislature because you would think that the bankers, the bankers, bankers associations and so on, would be on our team, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. this is the competition, except that they're not. And mostly they're silent and sometimes they come out on the side of the sharks. And the reason for this is because there actually is uh, big banking is funding a lot of this um, of a lot of this work uh, with lines of credit. For instance, Wells Fargo is on the watch list. Uh, Bank of America is on the watch list. So um, you know there are deep pockets that are involved in this and really want to preserve it. So uh, to get back to this sort of broader question now about about the high the high cost of being poor mm -hmm. anywhere in America, but particularly in New Mexico, can we talk a little bit about that and what what are what are the ingredients that that go into that terrible toxic mix of constantly working hard and getting deeper and deeper in the hole? You know, um, probably six or eight months ago, I was asked to be the community respondent to a Federal Reserve. Um, bank study of the impact of the recession and recovery on limited income populations. Wow. And um, in that, as I was reviewing, I had been slightly engaged in it for a while following what was going on. But when I was reading the research that the economist had done, one of the things I imagined is myself sitting in this chair with one bar after another bar popping up till I was paralyzed. Right. And so in that paralysis, what, what is there? Well, I have little or no access to mainstream financial institutions. So one of the very high costs of being poor is that I have no credit, and people have low or no credit. Everything costs more. But one of the things that lots of people don't understand is that if you have low or no credit, employers are using credit information as a primary screen for employment. Oh, my so 1,700 people line up for 700 jobs at Target, and half of them are cut before they even get through the door because there's a credit pull. Oh. So, um, so you know, my lack of credit not only cost has me cost uh, pay more for so many things like uh, utility deposits, like leases, like um, a, a car if I'm going to buy it, um, home uh, home ownership, all of those things cost more, but there also are actual barriers to employment in this process. So that's one of the very high costs of being poor. Um, the other thing is that if you are unbanked or underbanked, and it's estimated that about 45% of New Mexicans are unbanked or underbanked, then all of that costs more, right? So I have to, the Brookings Institute says that on average it costs $30 to cash a payroll or a benefit check if you are unbanked. $30 is, wow. is a heck of a lot of pampers or gas or milk or something that I need, right? So, um, so that's another of those things. Then we also, we estimate that whether you are a low-income worker or you are somebody who is on uh, veterans benefits or SSI or Social Security or any of those things, that there's about a 30% gap between what it costs you to live every month and... Um, and what your income is. So as a consequence, this whole thing about predatory lending emerges, right? Yeah. And what do we in America use lending for? We buy homes, we buy cars, we buy big ticket items usually with uh, on credit. We don't buy milk and bread, no. right? But so, so when we say this is not credit, it's a crime, that's what we're really talking about. If, in fact, we're going to address the shortfalls in people's um, income, then we need a better safety net 
and we need better jobs with better wages. That's what we need to be focused on. Early on, uh, <clears throat> in, in, in my life as a writer, I was constantly in debt. And I was in debt to small loan companies. Uh, and they weren't charging anything like 37% or anything even, I mean, it would have been, it would have been unheard of. Uh, but that practically ruined me. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you're going there for a thousand percent, mm -hmm. you are in debt peonage in a very real sense of the word. I mean, you're, you're at the company store mm -hmm. and they're own, they own you. And what do they require for collateral beyond your, your, uh, your initial title, uh, say for your car? These are largely uncollateralized loans, uh, except for the title loans. And, um, and that's one of the justifications that, um, that they have for these high rates, right? The, all of their loss. Well, in fact, before they have any losses, they frequently have made a huge profit, right? So, uh, so we're, we're flipping these loans over and over again. People are paying them. We had one woman come forward um, who was 55 years old, had a, had a number of health problems, and, uh, and needed uh, money to pay some co-pays and so on. So she had heard about title loans. She owned her car. You have to own your car if you're going to take out a title loan. Went down to a local place uh, that she had heard advertised and got $300. She started to pay on that and realized that it was going to be difficult for her to repay that loan. Went back in and talked to them. And they said, well, let us just give you some more money. So it became $1,000. And then she paid on that for nearly 18 months, and she had paid almost $10,000. And then she was in a place where she was going to miss a payment again, and they started, or missed a payment, and they started calling her and saying that they were going to take her car away from her. And she needed her car just to get to basic services for her health care, right? And um, she actually went to her uh, local pastor who assisted uh, not only in, in negotiating an end to this, but also hid her car for a period of time so they couldn't come get it. But those title loans are just the most insidious things. You know, when you go get one of those, you have to give them a, key, a set of keys to your car. Oh. But now, in addition to that, they also have uh, a device that they're putting on cars for the purposes of being able to disable your car if, in fact, you can't pay. So could we talk a little bit about the uh, refund anticipation loans? Uh, I'd like to hear about that too. So a refund anticipation loan is uh, provided to you based on what the expected um, tax return is that you're going to have. And, um, and they frequently are offered starting about in November. And so, um, you know, come pay for Christmas, come, you know, do something or other. Now, at that particular time, they're estimating your tax return. They, they, you have to pay them to estimate that. And, um, <laughs> and then there are lots of fees and so on that are associated with that. Uh, they have been unlicensed prior, to this, prior to, to this period of time. But there are two proposals, and that one of those is the one that went through the House yesterday, to, in fact, license these. And I did an analysis about these. Uh, first of all, IRS tells us that 92% of the people who use these are low-income homes. 62% of these are EITC, Earned Income Tax Recipients. So those are the working poor, right? Absolutely. The purpose of the EITC, both federal and state, is to help low-income working families stabilize. Yeah. And often that can be about 20% of your entire income for the, for the year. So it can be a big boost. Yeah. But with these, what's happening is essentially you are paying them to get your money now. You could get it in about 14 days if you were filing directly with the IRS. Um, and so, but so you're paying them to get it today instead of 14 days from now or 20 days from now. You're paying very high cost. Frequently, the estimates are incorrect. And so I'm going to, in the bill that is before the legislature right now, uh, they can loan me up to 85% of the estimate, right? So if they're wrong, not only am I, do I need to pay them more, but I also owe the IRS, right? Oh 
So when these things happen, what uh, what happens is that the tax return comes back to the payday, the uh, refund anticipation lender, not to me. And if there's some left, they write me a check. But you know, after they've loaned me 85%, up to 85%. I did some calculations based on two things, what the current proposal is, and also some testimony given by a guy whose name is Smith, who owns Navajo Trading Company up in Farmington, and has three licenses in that area. He was trying to demonstrate the demand for these loans. And so he was telling us how many, in testimony, how many of these loans had been made by this date certain. And the date certain was about halfway through, I estimated, the tax season. Already he had made more than 8,000 of these loans. Now, based on that and also his calculation that the average amount of the loan is $800, I calculated that he had made almost $2.5 million and we were halfway through tax season. And he's doing us a favor. So what would you tell our audience now? What is the one or two things they can do right now before the legislature uh, is gone to help uh, put an end to this stuff? And what and what can what can our audience do uh, uh, to help themselves? With respect to the legislation and the legislature, I think uh, what we have attempted to do this session is to create a level of community outrage that is absolutely righteous. And, um, and I think uh, listeners need to, um, to act on that. And what do I mean by that? I mean call anybody they know in power and say, help us end this. And that's not just their legislators. It is also city council people and, and county commissioners and everybody else. And um, until it's done. I think the other thing is we've really got to focus on money and politics and, uh, you know, really uh, is that they can vote against the will of the people. I mean, we, we have never had such broad base support for an issue uh, in my 30 years of being an advocate in this state as we have on this. And yet they just disregard that. How does that happen? And in terms of individuals and in taking care of themselves, uh, the first thing you want to do is to, you know, walk in the opposite direction of one of these turkeys. And, um, and I would suggest one of the things that you do is actually look at community banks and credit unions. We now have a couple of credit unions, Guadalupe and Santa Fe, Rio Grande Credit Union in, in Albuquerque, that really are looking at how do they help folks with this issue. I wish we had more time. Thank you so much. Perhaps later on, uh, after the session is over, we can come back before the end of the year and talk about these matters some more, because uh, I'd like to see what happens after the bills pass or fail and, and watch the impact. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been, a, it's been an honor and a real enlightenment for me. Thank you so much for having me. It's really important.